Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Jason Goodshaw from Premier Dental, and I'm sitting here with Dr. Troy Schmetting uh, from, uh, I believe it's Walnut Creek, California. Troy, did I get that right? That is correct. Walnut Creek, California, outside the Bay Area. Um, and he's uh, kind enough to share a couple of minutes with us to talk about cementation of uh, a zirconia crown for tooth number five. <clears throat> and a uh, little backstory, I, uh, sent Dr. Schmetting some of Premier Dental's new cement ZR Sem, and I wanted him to try it out and give me some feedback. I also asked Troy to, if he could, take a couple of pictures of a case uh, so that we could use, you know, in our education and our marketing and, you know, to spread the good word about our new cement. Well, he did that, and that was, uh, that was really, really nice of him. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do in our conversation today was... Um, to highlight you know, what he did and look at the steps and you know, talk to him about pearls because I can't help thinking about efficiencies in dentistry. Uh, to me, efficiency in dentistry means, you know, hey, we move quickly, but we also get it right the first time. And for procedures that we do so often in the dental office, and I'm thinking about like, you know, class two composite resins and single unit crowns, you know, efficiency is even more important because these things, these procedures take up a, a large portion of our clinical day. We have to do them correctly. And, you know, because it's a business, we also have to do them quickly. And when we can put those two things together, that's good for the patient and that's good for the office. So I really wanted to spend some time today with Dr. Schmenning talking about, uh, you know, his experience with our cement, but this isn't a product infomercial. This is really about, you know, how do we use what we have uh, to its fullest capacity and get that efficiency, especially in these single unit crown kind of cases. So with that, I'll say, hey, Troy, thanks for being here. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, my pleasure. Always, uh, always good to see you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, again, thanks for sending the photos. And uh, let's start off by looking at um, the case. Okay. So I can get that working. All right. Um, so we have it here on, I think, a 3D printed model, uh, yep. all zirconia crown on tooth number five. And um, do you remember, and I can actually go forward one more, you know, do you remember this case? Do you remember, why did we do a crown here? Yeah, so this was a crown replacement actually. So this was a uh, 20 plus year old crown that uh, had some recurrent decay, I believe on the distal lingual margin there. And so that was, that was the reason for uh, replacement on this. It was an old PFM style, obviously, in comparison mm -hmm. to our newer, newer generations of options. And so that's why we, um, we went with the uh, all, all zirconia restoration, which I tend to do a, a fair amount of um, when I'm doing replacements of uh, prior crown restorations. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question. When you think about maybe even the last 50 or 100 crowns you did, would you say that the majority of them are kind of all zirconia now? Or, you know, when was the last time you did a PFM? You know, good, great question. I probably haven't done a PFM in probably eight years, eight to 10 years, probably. Yeah, I've been kind of in the all ceramic world, so to speak, whether zirconia is ceramic or not, debatable, of course, but ultimately, yeah, I have not done a metal-based restoration in a number of years. Now, I will preface that with, I have done a couple of full gold crowns uh, on second molars in a couple particular cases, uh, one for restorative concerns, and the other patient wanted a gold crown. Wow. And so you don't hear that very often, I know, but it's wow. it's, obviously still a very good restoration in relationships to uh, longevity. So, but PFM, no, I haven't done PFMs in a number of years. Yeah, I, I still love doing those gold crowns. I know that uh, patients, sometimes patients love them. A lot of times patients don't like the look of them, but I think from, uh, from the dentist's perspective, we still feel like, boy, that's a pretty, pretty nice restoration. Yeah, it's still there, right? It should still yeah. be in your arsenal at all times. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I go forward here to, to show, this is you getting off the temporary. And right. um, uh, you know uh, we're gonna see it in a minute, but it's a beautiful prep and the gingiva looks great. Um, yeah. But what is very common, I think, when we get these temps off in a lot of cases is the residual cement. And so what kind of cement did you use in a case like this? And um, this is a vital tooth, I'm guessing. And you know any tricks for getting that off because we're going to be talking about resin cement and you know we don't want to just tear up that gingiva and have a marginal bleeding which could make bonding more difficult so what'd you do here 
Yeah, so really important. I mean, I think that's, you know, when you talk about um, efficiency and being quick and that type of thing, there's certainly things that, uh, I like the way you said that earlier about relationship too. You know, it's not always about how fast you can do something because at the end, fast sometimes will bite you in the behind. So these are steps in cementation. They're very important in relationship to obviously cleaning that stump, getting that well prepared, especially when we're dealing with a resin base type dentistry that a lot of us are doing. A majority of my cases are resin based. I don't use a lot of looting cements for particular reasons. So spending time on cleaning your preparation is critical. So how do I do that? Well, there's a number of ways. This particular case, this was um, temporized with a Duralon. We actually used a polycarboxylate and for reasons other than they were leaving the country. So, or not leaving the country, they were off for an extended period of time. Uh, and I wasn't gonna see them. So I felt a little bit more comfortable with a little bit more durable long-term cement. Do I use that often? No. Most of the times I'll use something in the, um, you know, in the premier world of a next temp, some uh, non, non-zinc oxide eugenol based material. But when you're talking about a polycarboxylate, these are a little bit more difficult. So what I generally use with these, I'll actually use a Cavitron. So I use a Cavitron to help remove um, all of that remaining um, cement. Most of the times though, I use uh, either a pumice, a non-fluoridated type pumice. And the my favorite go-to all depends on how well I can control the, uh, the tissue in terms of protection as I like to use air abrasion. I'm a big uh, air abrasion guy. And so if I can get an opportunity to place uh, some aluminum oxide to clean the surface of a tooth, I will do that. Not this particular case, but other times I'll use a lot of Teflon tape. I'll wrap the tooth in Teflon. Uh, I'll even sometimes slip a rubber dam over the top of that. Kind of depends on where you're at in relationship to margin design. This margin design makes it a little difficult to do air abrasion because like Jason said, when you start dealing with air abrasion, one of the big things you can cause is some hemorrhaging of the gum tissue, which in the end of the day makes it difficult in relationship to uh, a good resin-based cementation protocol. So different options options, but at the end of the day, it has to be addressed. Simply taking off that temporary and putting a little bit of water and uh, air on that, considering it a good good day is not in my opinion doing effective dentistry so ultimately some options and definitely options you need to weigh but stump shape or taking care of the stump in relationship to cleaning that is extremely important yeah absolutely you know and one of the things that i uh uh i don't know if you're like me but when i get uh the provisional off i mean there's a lot of cases where we just have to to anesthetize people just because they're they're sensitive um other times, not so much. And, you know, for uh, checking occlusion, I, I sometimes prefer not to have patients anesthetized if they're, if they're able to tolerate, tolerate it. Um, but when you think about putting uh, polycarboxylate cement on, which, you know, typically will bond to tooth and then, you know, be still there once you get the provisional off, uh, I feel like probably you had to anesthetize this patient. Was that the case? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, it was. It was a no brainer. We're going to be putting a, a cavitron on a, on a, a decoronated tooth. I think that's probably a good idea. Yeah. Um, so next, so we got the temp off. We've uh, now we've cleaned the preparation, and it's uh, and we've done a wonderful job there because we don't have any hemorrhaging. Um, now we're going to be looking at the the final crown here, and you know, just I think the way you talked about preparing the stump for uh, ideal bonding. Uh, I feel like, you know, you're just as meticulous with preparing the inside of the crown for that as well. So what'd you do here? You did uh, some air abrasion and a priming? Yeah, so really important with zirconia, and I think this is kind of the hidden step in dentistry in terms of what happens. You have to condition the substrate of these materials, whether it be a glass ceramic or whether it be a non-glass ceramic in the form of a zirconia. Extremely important to have that clean. Why? It's because zirconia does have the ability to bond, and I think there's plenty of research out there that uh, we can fall back on in relationship to bonding protocols in relationship to zirconia. So the most important aspect is after trying, after adjustment, whatever you've done, and prior to cementation, you have to condition the internal of that zirconia. So in this particular case, I used air abrasion. Um, there is other options to clean the internal of zirconia. Some of those could be, you know, uh, an Ivo clean or a Zir clean. Um, different products out on the marketplace that certainly, and basically what they're doing is cleaning that internal, giving you a fresh uh, phosphate site receptors. And that's the key with zirconia bonding is that you have a clean internal surface that allows the bonding protocols to occur. So if you can see on that bottle that you see, the, the Premier uh, Universal Primer, 
That's the next step in efficiency is a clean internal. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to place the uh, monomer on the inside. And the, and the key ingredient in this is, is MDP. And I think um, MDP is a term that all dentists should know. I think it's an extremely important, um, not whether you can spell it or not necessarily, but knowing the term MDP is extremely important because that's really the link in relationship to resin-based dentistry in in America today, in the world today for that matter. And it's a very important monomer. But what that monomer does is it has a strong affinity for metals, metal oxides, uh, tooth, all types of stuff in dentistry. So the clean surface, you're allowing that monomer to adhere to the zirconia, which in tune, when I take it back to the mouth in forms of using a resin cement, I'm gonna get an increased bond strength that I can't provide any other way in dentistry. Yeah. So that's kind of the basis of what you're seeing here. Yeah, I love that, and and I really, you know, what I'm what I'm hearing from you is 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 something that I think a lot of dentists do, and I, I use it a lot, but I'll use it one more time, which is you know sort of a belt and suspenders approach. You know, it's not just good enough to to put the cement in the crown and, and seat it on the tooth. There's these little steps, these very important detailed steps that really can help. Uh, you know, with with everything when it comes to this, right? It's you know, it's. Um, uh, making sure that the margins are closed and that in fact retention is maximized because you know we 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 put crowns on we don't want them to just fall off and there's some things we can do to really enhance that so I love the belt and suspenders that you're you're taking me through here with you know on the on the prep side on the restorative side uh, because again it you know if we're we're looking for that win win this is how you get there yeah one hundred percent. So here's our final prep, and I really like what you got here. So this is a um, uh, this is what like a you know like a sort of a chamfer prep uh, just at the gingiva or slightly subgingival. Yep, just slightly subgingival. Uh, you know, just your typical preparation design and style of what I mean. I basically used a chamfer uh, set up with an eight fifty six type diamond uh, and did a you know one hundred percent. Tend to do a lot of rounded margins just in the sense that we do scanning in the office, and I think. Um, when you're dealing with scanning, I think it's proven that most, the best research will show that scannable margins are more in that rounded margin type effect. Yeah. And so that's kind of the design I take a lot, you know, in this particular case, retention resistance form was an important aspect. Um, and so we achieved all those accomplishments just simply with using, in my particular case, an 856 burr is what I used on that. Yeah. Most of the production was already done in relationship to removing that old PFM, but, you know, cleaning it up, getting rid of the decay, those type of things, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I want to take you back though to when you you scanned it and uh, talk to me about tissue management because uh, the tissue looks fantastic here. So when you when you did your scan, did you place cord? Did you do paste? Was there? Did you not have to do any of that stuff? You know what? Is, because it really looks great here, and, and you know I think that that whole the look of the gingiva now starts with how you handled it last time. And so anything special? Yeah, absolutely. So generally me, I'm a, I'm a two chord technique type guy most of the time. Um, I would say 90% of them are the two chord uh, technique type guy. So yeah, we did a two chord technique, but I also use the paste. I, I, I'm a big Traxident guy. So I do utilize Traxident over the top of that just to get that final. There wasn't, as you can tell, the health of the tissue is good. So the patient generally has good home care. So generally the Traxident wasn't for a lot of hemostatic type stuff, but mostly just to push a little bit of that tissue out of the way. Mm. Um, uh, prior to my final scan on that. And yeah, as you can see, in combination with a, uh, a well-polished, well-trimmed temporary, you know, this is the type of effect you're looking for because we've all, we've all had that patient that comes back and the tissue's hamburger and you're trying to do ideal dentistry and it's hard. I mean, it's yeah. hard. So, you know, emphasizing home care with the patient, uh, the best of your abilities is important because it sure makes your day easier at the end. <sighs> Yeah, yeah, you, you know, exactly. And, and that's one of the things I'm, I'm really a stickler on at the end of the first visit is making sure that we've done everything we can to allow that tissue to heal. And, 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 you, and you nailed it, right? You know, if the temporary is well marginated and smooth and, you know, a patient knows how to take care of it at home, you end up with this when they come back. And this makes it that much easier to get everything off, clean it up, Gingiva is in good good shape, and then use resin dentistry, and uh, yeah, so really like kind of a nice setup for you here. Yeah, really nice. Yeah, uh, and then so this is the cement I sent you, and uh -huh. um, I always like to say, uh, you know, it's a self adhesive resin cement, and you know, the trick of these dual barrel syringes is always bleed twice. You know, once 
through the syringe on the on the left and then through the tip on the right. And uh, I like that you used um, a, a kind of a barrier sleeve here. Uh, it's called sleeve it. Um, but uh, you know, when you think about resin cements, um, you know, this is self adhesive. Uh, you know, is there something about that category that you like, or is it just kind of a universal one stop? You could use it for everything. Anything special about self adhesive resin? The category. Well, I think it's a really nice approach in terms of, um, you know, it, for me, it's going to fall still within that restoration that I'm going to cement that has retention resistance form. It's going to build in those type of things. I think if you're looking for these, I do a lot of um, minimally invasive preparation. So a lot of times I'm going to not utilize the self-adhesive by itself. I'll use that in combination with a resin bonding agent. So, but in this particular case, the case you're seeing in front of you, we have a plenty of retention resistance for. So I always tend to lean towards a resin because anytime I can get the advantage of an increased bond strength of some form or another to two structure, I think that's something that we take advantage of in today's modern dentistry. Uh, but retention resistance form is really the key for me, whether I'm going to use that self-adhesive resin cement with a bonding agent or without a bond agent. In this particular case, I chose not to utilize that. And the other nice thing is I, I just like the aesthetics that I'm going to get with a self-adhesive resin cement over a resin modified glass automer, which is very opacious, you know, depending on what you're looking at in relationship to, you know, in a first premolar, it's certainly in a smile zone for a very large population group, for sure. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm more concerned about how am I going to look? Am I going to change the opacity or change the appearance or am I going to create a line along the margin that's going to show a white cementation line so there's other factors that come along with just a self-adhesive resin cement but at the end of the day it's a good quality product that is easy to utilize um, in relationship to bonding protocols especially with zirconia yeah. or even a glass ceramic such as an emax yeah, I, I love that. I love that flexibility with with and, you, and again, perfect. Which is, you know, you could use it at, by itself, or you could add a uh, a bonding agent to. Again, this is, I think, the theme for for Dr. Schmetting is, you know, you know, the, the belt and suspenders. Uh, you know, you get that additional bond strength. You, you at least you have the ability to to grab it with that dental bonding agent when you're using that self adhesive resin cement. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. And so here we go. Uh, you know, you've loaded the. Uh, cement in the crown and then seated it and uh, take us through what's going on in here. So at this point, so I've loaded the crown or my, actually my assistant does my most of my loading for us, but stepping back one to that last slide in relationship to the bleeding of the barrels, I think that's really important that we understand how important that is because what we're asking is a dual barrel, which meaning we're asking for a dual cure resin cement to be utilized properly. So we don't know what's going on underneath there. So you got to make sure heading into the game that those pastes are consistent and you're going into the tooth with the proper mixture because those restorations will fall off if you don't have the right chemical mixture together right you need the yeah. right formulation so spend the time on that once again it may slow you down a step but in the end it's going to save you time uh, but in this particular case, we seeded the restoration and we allowed, you know, to get that little poof of material. So what do I do with this? So a couple options you have. Obviously, with a resin, you have uh, a couple options in relationship to attack here or just a, a complete um, polymerization, self-care polymerization. We went with the self-care polymerization. The only reason I did on this particular case is because I could control the environment, meaning I had them bite down onto a cotton roll. I allowed them to... Um, you know, stay in contact with that as I watch this material set. And so as the material starts to set, um, I can easily peel off that material. You can see I'm just barely touching that with an explorer and that material is just coming off. Yeah. Sometimes I'll tack it. A lot of it depends on how well I can control the environment. If I'm not able to control that environment and I'm concerned about a moisture uh, attacking that tooth, meaning I can't keep that area dry for very long, I'm going to tack it and get that polymerization just to occur immediately. The tack here on this is two to three seconds. So real quick tack and you're going to find this material cleans off extremely easy. I mean it's got a wonderful ability just to peel right off the margins. Uh, with that said though, I am not going to consider it a day and be, hey, I'm done. I'm ready to start checking inclusion. I'm still going to have that patient bite back onto a cotton roll or whatever your your tactic is in relationship to holding that in place and I'm going to allow that to set for four minutes for me I allow that to sit I believe that's the IFUs on this product is four minutes but I want that material to set 
And after the four minutes, I will even come back and I will polymerize from the buccal, the lingual, and the occlusal for another 20 seconds on each side. Whether that's helping me a lot, I don't know, but mentally it helps me a lot, right? Whether I'm getting in there. But at the end of the day, zirconia doesn't allow for a great deal of passage of light through it. So that's where it's important to understand the differentiation between a light cure resin cement or the dual cure that we have in this particular case. Dual cure, in my uh, estimation, is always a better option whenever in doubt whether you're going to get a light source to something. So this is what we did on this particular case, allowed it to set for its full um, four minutes. The tack, or the, excuse me, the putty consistency was at about a minute and a half, two minutes, where I was able to start to peel that off the margins rather quickly. And I will go ahead and floss that too at that point in time. I didn't show the flossing part of it, but I will floss at that minute and a half, two minutes too, just to make sure, because I don't want that to set up in approximately, because that can be very difficult to yeah, get out as sure. you're all experienced. Uh, but then I will allow it to set for its final um, four minutes. And then from there, I'm checking occlusion, doing all the necessaries that I need to do to make sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just great stuff, Troy. I, I love what you talk about there in terms of, you know, when you can control the environment, a let, you know, sort of letting it self-cure is, is a great option. And, you know, you can sort of watch it and control it. But if you're in the posterior and, you know, you almost feel like you've got a limited window to, to maintain isolation, tacking it, you know, does give you that, uh, that, uh, that option, which is, which yeah. is really cool. Yeah, no, gr great stuff. I mean, I, and then, and then the final crown is gorgeous. I mean, uh, this is immediately after everything, right? And you can see the blue mark from the paper on, on that, uh, on tooth number four there. So, you know, this is immediately after. Yep, immediately after. Um, great tissue adaptation. Uh, as you can see, the cleanup was really. So a lot of times you can tell a good resin that cleans up nicely is because how damages the gums. So if it's peeling off very nicely, you're going to have very minimal get, uh, damage because you know if you get that resin locked or adhered onto the two structure margin interface there, it can be a it can be a, a, a battle right in terms of using your curettes and whatnot. Sure. And you'll see that a lot with the gingival displacement and it'll be bloody all around that tooth for whatever particular reason. But if you do your steps and you do a good scan, obviously sending a good impression to your lab is going to help you a ton in the end. We get into that part of dentistry but ultimately that's a big part of it and allows your cleanup to be so minimal and nice yeah yeah i, I yeah you know i can't help thinking that uh you've made it look so easy in this one but but the truth is that and i and i really think this about uh those two procedures i mentioned at the outset which is the class two and then the single crown is that the devil's in the details, which means it should be easy by the time you get to this step because you've done all the other steps right and you've led yourself to what, what looks to be a very, very simple, um, straightforward and efficient crown cementation. And, you know, I, I, these are the ones we all hope for, I think, you know, 99% you know, of the time, maybe we get these, it's those other ones that are difficult. Maybe we can't control the gingiva or, our scan wasn't as good or our, our interproximal contacts or occlusion was needed some adjustment but you know this one just felt like a drop-in yeah it went really well but i think you hit it on the head i think you know dentistry as we all know is attention to details at the end of the day if you check all your boxes on your procedure it, it tends to turn out very very well it's just a matter of you know yeah. staying that focused and keeping that <laughs> keeping everything in a line because it's easier yeah. said than done of course especially with the patient that you're dealing with but at the end of the day all the boxes were checked here yeah. and uh, we couldn't be happier with the result yeah, I think that's if, you know, maybe that's the message is that, you know, even when you're looking at something that looks relatively easy, you've made it look easy. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on and the nuances and those little details that you've taken us through really have led up to, you know, again, that's that's how it how it gets easy is when you, when you pay attention to all that stuff. So uh, any final thoughts here? Uh, you know, patient was was happy and, uh, you know, you know, I don't know if you've yeah, seen it since, but it's still just surviving and looking as good as it is the, the, the day it was inserted. Yeah, I haven't heard from the patient or they didn't come back with it in their hand. So I consider that a success. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know, that, that's fantastic. Troy, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time and showing us some beautiful dentistry. I think I got one more picture, which is kind of more like a, a quadrant view. And it looks like tooth number two will be your next, next crown. <laughs> <laughs> Working on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, uh, yeah, Troy, thanks again. Just great stuff and uh, all the best. Thanks, my friend. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Premier Dental Inspired Solutions for Daily Dentistry.